I'm going to quote from the President of the United States. Are you prepared? <coughs> no, it's not the President that you think it might be. But I want you to hear something that President Reagan said when he was inaugurated as Governor of California in 1967. Please listen to this. Now, it's all over the internet, it's all over in libraries and books, but it's important. And this is what Reagan said in 67. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. I want to repeat that statement with an editing and see if this doesn't ring true. I'm going to just change a word. Christianity is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or, one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where the Lord was known. From chapter 2 of the book of the Judges. Now Joshua and Judges should be like one book. But when we read in the book of Judges, right after Joshua has died, verse 10, and all that generation, Joshua's generation, and all that generation were gathered to their fathers, they died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done. Think about this if you will. Three generations is about the extent of Christianity if it is not passed on. If you think about it, you are not going to be remembered very much, if at all, beyond the third generation. Your children will remember you. Your grandchildren will remember you. Maybe some great-grandchildren will know of you. But beyond that, unless you have done something astounding in history, you're not going to be remembered. The first generation was Joshua. He is the only one in the promised land that left Egypt with Moses. Joshua and Caleb are the only two of all those thousands of Israelites that came out of Egypt only Joshua and Caleb. Caleb is now dead, so Joshua is the last one to have been in Egypt in slavery. Joshua dies. Joshua is the one who said to the people of Israel in the Promised Land, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, a man of conviction, a man of faith, a man
man of honor. He's dead. He dies. There's a second generation because all of those Israelites that left Egypt had died in the wilderness in the 40 years sojourn. But there's a new generation that has come up and been born in the Exodus and are now in the promised land. That's a second generation. They're faithful to the Lord. They try to pass on the truths of the Lord. But the third generation that grew up in that land did not know the Lord or the works that he had done. Why is that so? The new generation does not know because sometimes the older generation does not tell. Your job and my job, our job, our task, our mission, our vision, what we are about is telling that old, old story we just sang of. If we are not faithful in telling it, and by telling I mean also showing it, because that's the way you really tell it, is showing it. I was always astounded at my grandparents. On my father's side, they never missed going to their Lutheran church in Pennsylvania. I never knew a Sunday that they did not go. I do not remember a day that they did not read from their little devotional book. And I never remembered a meal in their home in which you did not bow your head and have grace, they call it. And yet those grandparents were kind of mean. I never felt love from them. I never felt a closeness from them. I never felt an interest from them. My grandparents on my mother's side, the McIntyres, never went to their Presbyterian church. They just didn't go. Had nothing to do with it. Never heard them pray. And yet they gave such love to me as a child. How do you figure that? The churchgoers withheld love. Those who were not churchgoers, quote unquote, gave such love. So you really tell the old, old story by showing it. Not just with your lips, not just by going to church, not just by saying grace at the table. You show it in the love that you give other people. If the older generation does not pass that story on, a new generation will not know it. Now that's one reason. There's another reason that this other generation did not know the Lord. They wouldn't listen. Let's not put it all on the parents. Let's not put it all on the grandparents. They have to listen. For years, I did not listen. Until that day when someone led me to know Jesus Christ in that army barracks at Fort Paul. I've been listening ever since. And I listen to you. And I listen to this. But if you don't listen, it don't matter how much they try, it won't be passed on to you. So there's a failure of elders to tell sometimes, and there is a failure of youth to listen sometimes. And that results in a failure to obey the Lord. And all that generation.
generation were gathered to their fathers, then arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that the Lord had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. And on and on. And you read that book of Judges. Twelve times the vicious circle takes place in that book of Judges. The people sin, they do bad things, they leave God out of their life, they get into trouble, and God punishes them. Usually by sending some other nation to conquer them or subjugate them and make life hard for them. They get miserable. They cry, they weep, they moan, they groan. And they come to the prophet and say, oh, please pray for us. And he does. And God raises up a leader. And that leader, and they're called judges, don't think of a man in a black robe sitting on a bench making decisions, but think of a political military leader, and he gives them victory. And the people all repent, and they're all back with God, and everything's okay, and wow, looky there. And then the vicious circle starts all over again. Twelve judges in the book of Judges. Sin punish, repent and pray, be delivered, sin, punish, repent, deliver, over and over and over again. And that is not just the story of Judges, it's the whole story of the Old Testament. It's all through there. So why does God even try? Mike Sutherland has a quote on the internet. He wrote a blog. I don't know who he is. I don't know what church he is, what religion or anything. But I want you to hear what Mike Sutherland says. Evangelism. Now, what do you think that is? Getting up here, bang, 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 you come here. Right now, why, is that evangelism? Well, for some people it is. Mike says, evangelism means more than simply solicitating an altar call, conversion for someone, and adding another notch to your Bible, and moving on to the next hunting ground. True evangelism will lead someone to discipleship. Did you hear that? True evangelism. Come and accept Christ. Give your heart to Christ. Give your life to Him. Commit yourself to Him. And then from that day forth, the rest of your earthly life, discipleship, learning, growing, following, nurturing, believing, trusting, and loving other people. That's what evangelism is to my So, But in this story of the Jews, over and over and over again, God try. Why in the world does God try? Someone has said, how odd of God to choose the Jews. They were so rebellious. My goodness. You and I would throw our hands up. Why does God try with you? Why does God try with me? Why does he keep trying with us? Because we're rebellious. And sometimes we do wrong. And we fail him. And we lose faith. And we don't do the things we ought to do. Why does God bother even trying? Well, first of all, he made a covenant, a promise for his people. He said, I'll always be your God. When we are faithless, he is faithful. When we let down on the job, he really picks up on the job. God always keeps his promise. And he kept his promise with the Jews. That's the first reason. Why does God try? Secondly, God had a plan for his people. You see, if he hadn't used the Jewish people, he would use somebody. He would have found some nation. It might be some aborigine tribe somewhere, but he would have found some people. God had a plan to bring salvation to this world and he was going to use a people to bring forth 
a kingdom of righteousness that would issue in the personal Messiah, Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, God in the flesh. That was God's plan. And God has a plan for you. And he has a plan for me. He has a plan for this church. Even when we fail, even when we disappoint, even when we hurt, even when we go down the hill, God is still up there bringing us up because he has a reason, a plan for you, for me, for this church. He wants to use you. One, he makes his promise, he keeps it. Two, he has a plan. But here's what I get to close on. Did you hear that word close? Yes. Here's what I close on. The third reason that God keeps trying with that new generation, with you and with me, is he loves the world so much. You've heard it all your life. For God so loved Sacrificial love, agape love. He so loved the world. Africa, Brazil, New Zealand, Norway, China, America. God so loved the world that he gave, 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 till it hurt. He gave his only son, and whosoever believes, trusts, commits, whoever believes should not perish but have eternal, everlasting, never-ending life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved by him. God does not condemn you today. God isn't on your case today. He's not down on you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've even thought of doing. I don't know what you've left undone. I don't care what we do wrong or fail to do right. God loves all of us. He loves you. And he wants you right now. Would you give your life to him? You got another generation growing up? You gonna pass it on? Three generations. The church is only one generation away from extinction. And you are that generation. It's so true. Would you give your life? to God and trust